When you consider the immeasurable number of strategy IPs that have come and gone since the genre's dawn and meteoric rise to prominence in the 1990s, it's impressive to think that Command & Conquer, one of the mainstay series that helped to catapult the genre, is still in the front of mind of many strategy fans to this day. Despite not having a full release since 2010's questionable Command & Conquer 4, upcoming remasters as well as an obvious interest in the series from property owner Electronic Arts a shining light on something many thought had been irrefutably laid down and put to rest. And while we're nearing the release of what many people are hoping to be that stepping stone into a decade of CNC that's more like the 2000s than the 2010s, the closing of Westwood Studios and the release of Tiberium Twilight aren't the only things EA's done that's left people cautious of whenever they take a sideways glance at Command & Conquer. Let's go back in time, to the dark days of 2018. It's June, and EA Play is going on the weekend before E3. People are hyped, as they always are, for the Electronic Entertainment Expo, and while EA's affair doesn't garner quite the same level of attention as the main event, there's no doubt that there were a lot of wide-eyed gamers hoping for some thrilling or surprising reveals. And while we hadn't heard anything about a new CNC game, I think there's always an unspoken hope that maybe, just maybe, we would get an unexpected surprise with a remaster, new game, or something of the like. But what I don't think people are expecting, nor hoping for, was a mobile game that seemed to hold no regard for the legacy of series predecessors. And that game was of course Command & Conquer Rivals. Yes, they showed that trailer at EA Play to a live audience without any other news about Command & Conquer to back it up. And the absolute gall to show Kane walking on screen at the end. That's a oof from me. It's fair to say, people were not happy. No. Whoever controls that the looks like Nod. Fills up, we'll fire the missile. That looks like the Templar Nod and Ride. Don't you... That's... Oh my god, that's too good. Right, Command & Conquer, E3, super hyped. Turns out, it was the trashiest of trashy mobile games. You done fucked it up. Wow. Wow, EA. <laughs> oh my god. You can imagine how this would have felt the series veterans. Hell, you probably don't have to imagine. There's a pretty good chance that you're one of them. And despite that, and the fan reaction that followed, the minds behind the project were actually optimistic. They were confident that if people put aside their preconceptions and judged the game after they'd tried it, the majority would actually enjoy so, it. So, what do you say to the um, old school Command and Conquer fans um, that might be a little disappointed right now? Well, uh, you know, I think the most important thing for those guys to do is to try the game. Because I think, you know, and we'll get into it, that we've made something that's actually a ton of fun. Um, and maybe that's not totally obvious from what they've seen so far. Um, but as we've shown the game to people and really let them play it, we've seen this sort of skepticism that they initially had turn into this sort of like astonishment and then like oh my god this game is really cool which really mirrors my own journey with the game as well you can tell they believe what they're saying here and without any further context they seem genuine and this isn't just anyone making these claims by the way for those who don't know this is greg black who's been a part of the development of command and conquer generals tiberium wars red alert 3 uh, and also starcraft 2 he knows how to make a good RTS game, and he himself admitted that he was initially quite skeptical of the project when he was asked to be a part of it. Like, ooh, Command & Conquer Mobile, I don't know about that. Um, but I figured I'd go up and see what they were working on, and pretty skeptical, to be honest, going into it. I was like, there's no way this is going to be anything I'm going to want to have a part of. Uh, but when Ian showed me the game, our creative director, during my interview, was just like, let's play some matches, and I was just immediately smitten by it. I just saw the hex grid, I got what they were doing, and played a couple games and was like, this is super fun. So who do we believe? It's obviously pretty rich of EA to announce a game like this after ending the series on an extremely poor note with CNC4, cancelling multiple future projects, and then just not talking about the entire series for years. 
It's a brazen, soulless cash grab that only exists to drum up nostalgia from a beloved name and suck wallets dry through ridiculous microtransactions and pay to win mechanics. Or is it? Wait, no, 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 what am I saying? That has to be right. This game sucks. And as upholders of the Command and Conquer legacy, we are right to unconditionally hate it. Aren't we? If you love the cheesy nature and off lighthearted tone of older CNC games, then you'll be disappointed to hear that there really isn't anything like that in Command & Conquer Rivals. In fact, the game doesn't really have much of a tone at all, likely due to the fact that there are no cutscenes, story elements, or narrative paths to speak of. The game is purely based around player versus player combat after all, so there's no single player mode to give context to anything that's really happening. But honestly, that's probably a good thing. I wouldn't trust a game like this to deliver any sort of respectable Command & Conquer story, so personally, I'd rather have nothing than something bad. It's clear the developers didn't intend to do anything like this either, as they described the game as more of a Command & Conquer All-Stars than a canonical entry into the universe, which is apparent from the mishmash of units and characters available in the game, which all come from different eras in the saga. You got classics like the Mammoth Tank and Attack Bikes, as well as units created specifically for Rivals itself, like the Razorback. The leaders for each faction are also mixed. There's a few historical figures in there like Cain, Seth, and General Solomon, as well as a couple of others that are making their first foray into the universe. Though considering the nature of the game's setting, I wouldn't expect to see them again in any other CNC property down the line. And to give credit where it's due, seeing the wide variety of infantry, vehicles, and aircraft from both Nod and GDI is pretty sweet. And overall, their designs are great. While they can be a little bit cartoonish at times, mainly because of some interesting scaling of bigger units in particular, I actually think they are a lot more lore friendly than what was in CNC4. You can really tell with units like the Nod Avatar and Nod Scorpion, and their appropriate appearance definitely gives them an air of credibility that their Tiberian Twilight versions definitely did not possess. Plus the designs for the units are pretty badass. Especially Nod units, damn, like look at this Confessor, that looks sick. Anyway, I think credibility is always a hot topic when talking about a game like this, and putting aside our preconceived notions of it not being a real Command & Conquer game, I've got to say, I think the game feels as authentic as anyone could have hoped for, considering the platform it's on and the gameplay it's aiming for. It really does feel thematically appropriate, which is something I honestly did not expect going in. Like I said before, the graphics aren't too cartoony or outlandish, and the soundtrack isn't bad either. It's no masterpiece, but still. And I think it's the small things that make all the difference. Flavor text on units, the quips they make when given orders, the announcer voice, combat sound and visual effects, unit design, soundtrack... <gasps> all of them combined to make a game that's had some real effort put into its authenticity by people who have a pretty apparent working knowledge of prior Command & Conquer games. While Rivals is, by definition, a real-time strategy game, don't expect it to play really anything like previous entries. And that's no surprise, of course. Developing a game that's made for a 5-inch touchscreen and meant to be played in short, bite-sized sittings is hugely different to making one for traditional devices with tried and tested inputs. And look, don't think I'm gassing the game up here for overcoming some monumental barrier. I'm just saying that there are inherent differences when making games for phones rather than PCs. Anyway, back on topic. Rivals is based around short, few minute long matches between two players on a small map. You both get a base on either side, flanking an active missile silo in the middle. The goal is to hold a majority of the control points across the map, which will then fill the launch bar. And once that's filled, it's fired by the player who's in control of it at the time. You hit the enemy twice or destroy their MCV through direct damage, boom, victory's yours. And that sounds pretty simple, right? Well, yeah, it does, and that's because it is. But despite that, the game actually has a lot more depth than I thought. So let's dial it back to the pre-game and I'll show you what I mean. There is a fairly wide selection of units available and they're all unlocked through leveling and opening their respective cards in loot boxes. Don't worry, we'll talk about both of those systems more later on. You can have up to six different units available to construct at any one time, as well as your choice of leader which comes with a select ability. And both of those are dependent on the faction you're playing, a nod or GDI. Units are trained from a few different buildings which will need to be built in-game before you actually can get access to those troops or vehicles. 
You also have your familiar harvester, which will bring in your resources automatically once it's constructed. And from there, it's really up to you. You choose how to approach the match, picking which buildings to invest in and what units to create. Combat has an extreme reliance on unit counters, and when I say extreme, I really mean it. All units are broken into categories, infantry, vehicle or aerial, and each is strong against one or two of them. For example, if your opponent is fielding Nod Militants, then you'll want to counter them with something like a GDI Rhino or Shockwave Trooper, both of which excel at wiping infantry from the field. Not playing to your strengths with these counters will put you at a severe disadvantage. Attacking units with ones that aren't effective against it does a fraction of the damage anything else would, and your opponent will make short work of you if they even have an ounce of skill in the game. So the strategy in picking your loadout comes down to a mix of playing to your strengths and covering as many of your own weaknesses as possible, and you want to balance the two as much as you can. You may be able to counter every type of unit in the game, but if all your units are vehicles, then you're going to be opening yourself up to an opponent who might excel at destroying them. Matches play on a hex map and there's a large number of layouts that you'll experience throughout. Everything always takes place on a single screen, which is nice when you're playing on such a small device that you're holding in your hands. The biggest changes from map to map are the placement of the missile silo and its associated control pads. Sometimes there's two, other times there's three, and it's an interesting dynamic that's going to keep you on your toes. It's especially exciting when the Tiberium fields are adjacent to the control points, as it's very easy for a player to sneak across and take out your opponent's harvester before they can react, which will give you a tactical advantage and a nice Tiberium ejection to boot. Like every other RTS out there in existence, resource management fills out a decent portion of what you need to be focusing on throughout the match. In Rivals, there's one thing to harvest, which is, of course, Tiberium. There are three collection speeds, which are reached by having zero, one, or two harvesters respectively, and how heavily you invest in your resources is a core part of your strategy, as you may want to spend early to rush your opponent or save up to invest in late game units which can steal a win at the end of a game. Whichever way you take it, there's a surprising amount of depth to be had in games that are often over in less than 3 minutes, and it really did change my opinion on the idea of Rival's existence. Like the developers kept saying before its release, play the game before you write it off, you'll probably have a good time whether you want to admit it or not. And in that time, you'll primarily be playing in the ranked PvP ladder. You have two ranks on your profile, one for GDI and one for Nod once you've unlocked them. So you can play just one faction if you want and level them up, or do a mix of both, it's purely personal preference. At the end of the month it resets for a new ranked season anyway, so you can try out different things and see what you like most. But if you're not feeling like grinding out medals competitively, then there is usually some sort of timed unique mode available to switch things up if you like. Once you complete a game, you'll be rewarded with experience, coins, fuel, and medals which improve your score on the ranked ladder. While the experience helps to level your account and unlock new cards and goodies, coins and fuel are arguably the most significant rewards, as they're both used to directly increase your card collection and level up your units. In the case of fuel, that can be used to refresh your bounties, which function as missions which give you coins. You can order crates which can be continuously done, providing you have at least one fuel and you don't have a crate currently on order. And these crates can be a multitude of different rarities, so sometimes you'll find yourself getting lucky. You can also spend one extra fuel to speed up your crate's arrival. Now what is a crate you ask? Well, it's uh, the nice way of calling it a loot box. It's a random assortment of unit cards of varying rarities, plus some currency to boot. You'll need these to both unlock units for use as well as level them up by merging duplicate cards and paying a fee. Coins are the currency used to do just that, while also being used to buy rotating specific sets of cards in the shop. So to level up a unit, you basically need to train it three times by paying coins, and this gets more expensive as that particular unit gets higher level. Once that's done, you spend a certain number of duplicate cards to increase its level by one, and the requirement for how many duplicates you need also increases the higher you go. And basically you can just keep doing this until you run out of either coins or duplicate cards, which is something you will certainly run into often, especially if you decide not to open up your wallet to EA. Out of game grind aside, the actual core gameplay, the stuff you're doing most of the time, I have to admit, it's a lot of fun. Which really surprised me. What really got me was the depth it had. Going in, I personally expected less than nothing, considering the game's reputation and how, as a CNC fan, I'm conditioned to hate it, based solely on the fact that it exists. But as I played, it, actually, it astonished me. I was actually having fun. And if that was the whole story, I'd be more than happy to tell you to put down your pitchforks and just give it a try. And while I may still do that at the end, there are some other things to consider. 
there's still a really large elephant in the room that we need to discuss. One of the big fears many people held for Rivals before its release was its potential monetization. EA doesn't have a great track record when it comes to these things and people were very vocal in their concerns for how it could affect aspects of the game. From its competitive balancing to its viability as a free to play title. And this is something the developers were definitely aware of, addressing it in interviews after the game's announcement and doing their best to quell fears that monetization would suffocate the game before it had even been given a chance to succeed on its own merits. How are you guys planning on curbing pay to win while making the game profitable and successful? Happy to take that one. This is super important to me, and I know all of the designers. We are fully committed to making this game all about competition and having every match be fun, fair, and competitive. Every player should have a chance to win the match based on their skill and strategy, and that's it. Um, so on the progression system and on monetization, there's nothing in the game that is behind a paywall. Every player will be able to unlock all of the content. Um, what pairs will be playing for is just to accelerate that progression. And I have to say there are some really smart features Rivals includes to make it viable to take part without handing over a cent. But on the other hand, the game takes every opportunity under the sun in order to try and convince you to buy a pack and upgrade a level, anything and everything. Almost every part of the game is one way or another encouraging you to spend. Often the first thing you see when starting the game is a prompt for a new limited time offer that delivers a killer deal, 4.5x value, you'd be silly not to buy it, gold league exclusive offer, how could you not, 2x value, one time special currency limited offer, holy shit mum get the credit card. They just never stop coming and these all just go along with your expected massive bundles of both of the in-game currencies available. And while we've talked about coins, there's also diamonds. And well, what can you do with diamonds? Well, they're the game's premium currency that you earn at a really slow rate through gameplay. Well, no, you can't really do anything much with those, just little things like, you know, buying levels, unlocking new units through crates, speeding up your free crate deliveries, XP and coin boosters, much faster card cloning. You know, nothing really at all. I'm obviously kidding here, that's a heck of a lot. So that leads to the question, is Rivals pay to win? Well, yeah, to a degree, yeah it is. Your player level is unrelated to your position on the competitive ladder. So, in theory, you could buy your way to level 60, unlock the most powerful units in the game, and crush your way up the ladder until you reach a point where you're on an equal footing, whether that's by gameplay skill or your opponents also having the best units in the game. Though luckily the rank ladder does apply limits on your unit's level depending on how high up you are, so they will be reduced to that maximum through the match. So while you can have units that are a couple levels up, which don't get me wrong, can still be very impactful, you can't completely flatten your opponent with max level units from the get go. You've noticed before that I said it's pay to win to a degree, and the main reason for that is that you do still need to know what you're doing. If you're terrible at the game, don't utilize your unit strengths and the correct counters, then a competent player will have the advantage over you, a big one. But take this as an example, when I started playing, I played nearly 30 games before I lost one. 30! And that's someone who isn't even great at PvP RTSs and didn't pay a cent into the game. You could absolutely clean house if you were a competent player and opened up your wallet. But like I said, you will reach an equalization point eventually, so it's not all doom and gloom. And to be honest, the game does come off quite generous, at least to start with. You get a lot of crates, a lot of cards, and a decent amount of coins, but once you hit a certain level, things start getting expensive. Really expensive. Once a unit reaches level 7, one upgrade requires 1000 coins, and remember you need 3 of those in order to increase its level. That's 3000 per unit as well as the increasing number of cards you require to go with it. So far I've reached level 17 and most of my 2 go units are at level 6 or 7, and they can go to 15 max. And man, let me tell you, it's going to take some real grinding in order to get those any higher. Or some cash if EA had it their way. Which I'm sure is what they're going for. Get you hooked after a decent amount of play, then start the real grind, which is when you start considering paying a bit of money to speed things up. And fair play to them, they've got to make their money somehow, but I definitely think there's better ways for them to do it. 
Earlier, I alluded to some smart features that Rivals includes that make being a free-to-play player a lot more viable, and I want to give credit to those because they are very welcome and very smart. Firstly, all units and leaders are able to be earned and bought through the currency you earn from gameplay. So thankfully, nothing is locked out for those who don't want to spend, though you will have to grind your way to get there. Next, there's something called a challenge match, which is one of my favorite features to the PvP. Basically, if you're at a significant disadvantage against your opponent, whether that's from having higher level units, units you've never seen before, or are at a much higher rank, then a challenge match is initiated and it's clearly shown to you at the start of the game. It's then impossible for you to lose medals if you're defeated, and if you win, you'll receive extra medals and experience. It's a great idea, it simultaneously makes you feel like an absolute boss if you can overcome it, and not making you feel like the game screwed you over if you lose. But the name isn't a lie, it's called a challenge match for a reason, and there was a point for me where around 3 of every 5 games I was playing was a challenge match, and I can't say it didn't get annoying to be constantly pummeled by units I've never seen before that were a level or two above my own, despite not losing any medals in the process. And that leads me to my last point, which isn't necessarily regarding monetization, but I think it fits. Losing in Rivals sucks. Like it really hurts to lose. I can't exactly say why, I don't have any quantifiable stats or data to back it up, but it just sucks. Maybe it's because units die fast and when you're getting bodied it feels like you can't do anything, or how everything happens so quick that looking away for just a second will put you at a severe disadvantage, or maybe because it's the nuke is big and loud, I don't know. But let's put our tinfoil hats on for a second. Maybe the game is designed with the secret intent of making a loss feel terrible, so you'll want to spend more money to buy shiny new powerful units in the hope that you'll win your next one. And since winning feels so good, buying packs to get more stuff and increase your chances of doing so is an enticing idea. Okay, look, I'm probably reaching. Losing feels bad in any game, especially in my experience in PvP RTSs. But let's not kid ourselves, EA is the company after all that's been voted the worst company in America more than once, destroyed Star Wars Battlefront 2 with loot boxes, closed multiple beloved studios, and ran similarly beloved game series into the ground. Is it really that much of a stretch to think that they would go out of their way to make a loss feel bad in order to get people to buy loot boxes? I'll let you decide that one for yourself. Look, we've talked a lot about Rivals, and don't worry, it's almost over, but I think we need to take a step aside for a second and talk about companies announcing mobile games of classic franchises at big shows, because there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. Let's take a look at Fallout Shelter for instance. Imagine if at Bethesda's E3 conference in 2015, Fallout 4 hadn't been announced or even mentioned. Instead, Daddy Todd just waltzed out and said, hey guys, we made a mobile Fallout game. That's all, bye. I'm inclined to think people wouldn't have been nearly as excited as they were with what actually happened. You see, people were already hyped for Fallout. They'd just spent nearly an hour talking about Fallout 4 and how great it was going to be beforehand. Hell, Bethesda could have announced anything Fallout related and people would have lapped it up. Now let's compare that to something like Diablo Immortal. Do you think people would have been that mad if Blizzard had spent an hour, or even just five minutes, talking about Diablo 4 first? You see what I'm getting at? If people are expecting or hoping for something big, like a mainline release in a series they love, and then get a mobile spin-off game that feels like it's made with bad intentions, they're going to feel betrayed and get riled up. I'm imagining an alternate universe where before announcing Rivals, EA took some time to discuss the then unannounced remasters for the original Command & Conquer games. Get the fans on your side first and maybe you'll actually be able to get some positive press for your game that you've clearly put some effort into, rather than have your entire fanbase hostile to the idea from the second you get it out there. Look, here's my final opinion on Arrivals after playing it for admittedly more than I would have thought and trying to put aside my preconceptions. Yes, it tries to get you to spend every two seconds. Yep, it gets pretty grindy if you're free to play. Yes, you can gain a significant, though not game-breaking advantage if you pay real money, especially if you do it early on. Yep, it's got loot boxes, and yes, it's not a traditional Command & Conquer game. But to hell with it. If you can look past all that, and look, I really do get it if you can't, but if you can, the game is fun. Gameplay is far deeper than it would seem on the surface, and its non-stop action makes for explosive and exciting games that can be played wherever you are, 
whether that's in the car, or in the bathroom, or at the extended family's Christmas party. Now like I said before, and I want to be clear on this, this is not a traditional Command and Conquer game, and I am not trying to make it out like it is to any extent. It's purpose built for mobile, and it functions great as a mobile game with touch controls. So while I will say the gameplay is deep, I'm talking in the context of mobile RTS games, and not in comparison to classic Command & Conquer games of old. So, if you can put aside all your preconceptions and want to play a mobile RTS game, then take heed of what the developers initially said back when the game was announced. Just give it a try and see what you think. It's free, it's on Android and iOS, and if you actually do end up liking it, you can hide it away in a folder on your phone somewhere so you don't have to admit to your friends that you're playing the game that you've all been memeing on for the last year. Thanks for watching everyone. Boy, that was a long one. Anyway, thank you all for sticking with me, I know this came later than usual so I appreciate you guys having to wait so long. There's going to be a shorter video out in a week or two and after that I'll be getting back into the Red Alert series with Red Alert 2, so make sure you subscribed if you want to see that. Also, if you want to follow me outside of YouTube, then there's a link to my Twitter down below. And I've also recently started a Patreon for the channel. So if you like what I do and are interested in supporting that, then I would really appreciate you checking it out. Thanks again, I hope you're all having a great holiday season, and I'll see you all next time.